let's talk about healing, hope, and the possibility of afterlife. As we all will go through some kind of loss at one point in our life, and we will need help to get through it, even if you don't think you do. We're here to help you find your light at the end of the tunnel. Whether it's a dream, a visit, a vision, or a newfound life after loss, we believe life and love never dies. This is Surviving Death and Dying with Trisha and Misty. Our guest today is a clinical psychologist and a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. Matthew McKay, PhD, co-founded Hate Ashbury Psychological Services in San Francisco back in 1979 and served as the clinical director for 25 years. Currently, he's the director of the Berkeley Cognitive Behavior Therapy Clinic. He has explored spiritual and afterlife issues in two previous books, Why and Your Life on Purpose. He's also the author of several professional and self-help psychological books, which you can also learn more about on his website, seekingjordan.com. The name of his recent book is The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, Jordan's Message to the Living, What to Expect After Death. And you can find it on Amazon, Audible, and in paperback. Welcome, Matthew McKay, PhD. We are honored that you are taking the time to share your story with us today. I'm glad to be with you, Tricia and Misty. Thank you. Thank you. And first of all, we do want to say condolences. Yes. The story we have to recognize as we're trying to stay positive and uplifting is a heartbreaking story. And we are very sorry for your loss. Can you tell us the story of what happened to Jordan? Yes. uh, 13 years ago, uh, Jordan was riding his bicycle home from work back to the flat he shares shared with his girlfriend. And he was assaulted by four men who probably wanted to steal the bicycle. And there was a big fight and um, eventually he broke away from them and one of them shot him and he died on the street. And so as would be the case for any parent or anyone who loses someone they deeply love, uh, I, I was just consumed with a need to know two things. One is, does his soul still exist? Is he, is he still somewhere? And, uh, and is he okay? Those were the things that I just felt this tremendous need to know. And so we, it was really a, a long journey to be able to start actually talking to him. It started with going to mediums and having sort of one-way conversations where the medium is reporting things that Jordan is saying or conveying to us. There was a lot of value in that. I mean, uh, you know, we went to see uh, Austin Wells and, and Felix Lerma, they, and, and they, they really gave us a sense that Jordan was, was there. Um, But I then went on to consult Alan Botkin, who wrote a book and discovered something called induced after death communication. And, and you, you're familiar with this, I think. And Botkin accidentally discovered a way of talking to the dead. I found this fascinating. I recently heard about this and I'd love for you to expand on that a little. And I'm also going to backtrack some of this stuff you're talking about. You're packed full of information, but this induced after death communication, please do share a little bit about what that was like. Yeah. Botkin is a behavioral psychologist. Uh, he, he worked for many years for the VA, worked a lot with vets who'd been traumatized by war. And he used uh, techniques that I use, uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is a a technique that uses bilateral stimulation uh, to help people recover from trauma. And we use it a lot in our our clinic in in Berkeley, uh, the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic. So it's something I'm very familiar with, but Botkin accidentally discovered a variation on the protocol that produced very surprising results. He he was working with a, a vet who had profound grief over the loss of a of a little nine-year-old girl that he had befriended in, in, in Vietnam and planned to uh, adopt and take back to the States. And uh, she somehow became the victim of a, of a landmine 
and died in his arms and he just never recovered. So Botkin is treating him using EMDR with the assumption that it's going to hopefully address some of the, tra the traumatic grief, but he makes a little mistake in the protocol and the vet pauses for a while and then later reports that he had this full experience of seeing Lee, of talking to her. She communicated a lot to him and his grief just disappeared. It was, it was miraculous. Wow. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And, and later on, Bakken did a study and he had 83 vets who, who had a traumatic grief of some kind. He, he didn't tell them what to expect. He just treated them with his little variation of EMDR and 81 out of the 83 had this amazing experience. And I, I use his variation myself with, with clients who are dealing with traumatic grief. And about half the time I've actually, they've actually had this, this after death communication It's a profound and powerful thing to, to witness. So yeah, it's, it, it, it was, and for me, when I went to see Bach and I had that experience, I, I heard Jordan's voice. He was telling me things that were incredibly important to me that he's still with me, that he's still with both of the, myself and my wife loves us. He's in a good place. I mean, he, he told me the things that I needed to know. And I heard them as they, as if they were coming from outside, they were not, uh, you know, not voices in your head, not a voice in my head. So it was a really profound experience and helped a lot. Um, but I still, it still, it was kind of a one way communication. Right. I, I, I was sort of a, a passive and, and I was getting messages from him either through mediums or through induced after death communication. And I wanted something that would allow me to actually uh, have a conversation. And so I consulted uh, the late Ralph Metzner, who was a psychologist who specialized in after death communication and, and, the, and this kind of the study of the afterlife in general. And uh, in the space of probably about 10 minutes, he taught me how to channel, do channel uh, communication, channel writing. And that's amazing. Yes. And I do want to dig into that more, but I want to back up for a minute. As we were saying, you were just packed full of information that a lot of people want to know and hear, and they're desperate to hear. But my first fear, and my kids are in that age, 21 to 24, and it terrifies me to think about the loss. So my, my first, and you said this has now been 13 years for you. And I know time in a weird way, I, I don't think heals, but I think it buries and covers up emotions sometimes that are still there. But what would you say to a parent just in those first days? How do you get out of bed when you found out you just lost? How do you get to, you know, what is that early stage before where you're at now, where you can openly and freely speak about the event? What was that first week for you like? I just felt kind of blown apart. And, and I, the, ex the experience was as if I had entered a desert without any landscape, with just emptiness, just uh, a profound emptiness and loss. And like I was just wandering through this, this empty place and, and had no idea how to get to the other side of it or whether I would get to the other side of it. And I was almost kind of dissociated. Like I was, I really don't have very clear memories for for that time because um automatic pilot i just just putting one foot in front of the other and everything around me reminding me of jordan and and reminding me of this loss and, and trying to make sense of it so it was a overwhelmingly painful experience and I, and of course it that experience really motivated me to to try to make contact with jordan and so i do that with grieving parents i do see people who've lost their children and work with them. And, and one of the most important things is to help them get into actual communication with their child. And that is a profoundly meaningful and, and healing experience because of the things that they hear back and the answers to the questions that they have give them reassurance that their child is still with them and and is, is okay. So those are the things that really are important, I think, for anyone who's lost a loved one to know. That's very helpful. Thank you. Did you feel Jordan's presence before seeking that medium? Before seeking the medium? Yeah. Felix Lerma and, and uh, 
yeah. Austin Wells. Yeah, I mean, I, I would experience his presence in, in dreams that were very vivid and felt like visitations. Mm -hmm. um, other people were also experiencing visitations from him, some of them in waking states. He was, he was able to show up to a number of people in waking states. Wow. And so we were getting a lot of messages from people who he loved and loved him that he was making contact with them in various ways. We had a fairly strong sense that he was around. And so it was a matter of finding a method that uh, would open the channel so that so that the communication could be more than kind of just a, a felt sense or a, or a dream visitation, but something where we can actually go back and forth and ask questions and answer them. And you know, right. so that that yeah. made a huge difference to be able to do that. And so and channeling is very easy. I, I mean, I just want to say this to you and your audience. Yes, I, I've taught channeling to hundreds of people and most of them can do it. I love that. And it's not particularly hard. It's a relatively easy process. And so people who are grieving, people who, who want to have contact with loved ones, they don't necessarily have to go through a third party, a medium or someone who can create kind of a, a hypnotic connection. And they can do it themselves and they can ask their own questions and get their own answers from their loved ones. So channel communication is in the realm of possibility for everyone. You don't have to be clear audience to do it. And we're going to talk about that in detail before we hang up with you, for sure. We're going to circle yeah. back to that. Because that is one thing I want to learn myself too. <laughs> and it is something I have been practicing. And after reading your book as well, I have tried your methods and I will talk more about that in a second. I think what you're hitting on a lot of parents can relate to right away is in those early stages, just that feeling and that knowing that, wait a minute, they are somewhere. Where did they go? How do I reach them? And they're desperate to find them. And I've also heard sometimes when you're so overwhelmed with grief, it's hard for your loved one to get through to you, but they are trying to get through you. Do you have anything to say on that? You're exactly right. And it's a sad kind of paradox. You know, you're, you're overwhelmed with grief and you have this inc incredible desire to connect to your loved one. And it's and it's that very grief that gets in the way of the desire. It really does kind of block the channel. There's so much emotion inside of you. And even just thinking about your loved one, you're filled with emotion. You do kind of need a degree of quietness mm -hmm. to open the channel. And I mean, I, I use simple Vipassana meditation to develop that quietness. And uh, also you can use auto hypnosis to do it. Mm -hmm. Even prayer. Yeah. Uh, can function yes. as a quieting technique, essentially, that will open the channel. So, I mean, there, there are different ways of doing it, but using a simple br breath-focused meditation right. uh, is one of the easiest ways. So anyone who is in that very deep grief and wanting desperately to hear from their loved one or their child, they need to recognize that maybe your loved one is trying to reach you and maybe you need to calm down and settle your mind and follow these meditation techniques and get to a point that they can get through to you. Cause it's almost like maybe your telephone line's busy. <laughs> they can't call you, but I'm curious if your feelings about afterlife had changed after Jordan died, or if it was different prior to losing him, your perspectives just in general. Well, most of my life, I've been an agnostic and haven't really had a very strong sense of what might exist for us after this life. But I guess it was about maybe 16 years ago, I read Newton's book, uh, Michael Newton's book on uh, Journey of Souls. And I had a friend who wanted to have that experience of that, of that hypnotic induction that he used. Uh, and I am a skilled hypnotherapist. And I so I just, uh, Newton had also published a book on how to do it. And so I, I just read the, the instructions and I'm a good hypnotist. So I did that with her and I've done it subsequently with lots of people. And it really has had a deep effect on me to, to witness and, and listen to people describe the afterlife as they experience it uh, in the induction. And Newton, he did some amazing research. I mean, he did this with 7,000 people before he actually published any of his books and and people would not know what to expect and he simply led them through a process and you know led them to a past life and then bounced from the past life into the life between lives and had them describe what they see and 
almost all of these people described exactly the same main elements. Yes. Which is extraordinary. Amazing. And that's the same thing with near death experiences and Brian Weiss's work mm-hmm. that he's done, who I, you know, a yes. big fan of Brian Weiss as well. And knowing that all these different people from different parts of the world and different religious backgrounds are saying the same thing. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah. And I know you said you've lost your parents. Have you been able to communicate with them as well? I've had some contact with my dad. Most of my focus has been conversations with Jordan, but I have talked a bit to my dad. Nice. Have you had dreams or anything from your parents or Jordan as well? Oh, I've had lots of dreams regarding my father and meant quite a few of which I experienced as, as visitations. Even my father's been dead for more than 50 years. But even recently, I, I have dreams that feel very much. You still feel connected. And I have dreams with Jordan that give me that same sense. So, yeah, you know, I'm having other ways of feeling connected besides channeling. But right. and dreams are just a profound gift when you have those visitation dreams, those, those yes. super real experiences that you wake up feeling the love of that person. It's just it's lovely. I've had one and I'm well, I want more, but I've had one visitation dream from my dad. So I understand that feeling is amazing feeling. Is there a book that is coming that you haven't done yet that with your dad or about your dad, love in the time of impermanence, impermanence? Love in the time of impermanence. Well, it's not exactly about my dad. I mean, it, it also has it's ch- a lot of it is channeled from Jordan, Okay, um, but it's, it's about how, how do we hold on to love? when everything is changing around us and in the face of death, in the face of all of the uncertainty and change that besets us, how, how do we hold on to love? So it, it, the book is really about that. And, and Jordan has a lot to say and his channel material in the hit in that book from him is boxed off. And so it was kind of a joint effort. Well, I know he provides a lot of information and as you even referenced to me, it's more validation as the Michael Newton studies have shown with Journey of Souls. So we wanted to ask some specific questions about things you learned from Jordan in this particular book and dig a little into that. Cause I know you mentioned that there are, you know, about four things that he thinks every soul needs to know. And we kind of want to brush through some of those things with you. Okay. Where should we start? Well, I think everyone wants to know why we're here. But even before that, one of the first things I think people are curious to know is at the moment of our own physical death, what happens? Did he tell you what it was like when he discovered he passed or that moment? Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, he was very confused. I mean, he, for, for a while, he couldn't quite understand why he couldn't move his body. Uh, he was sort of hovering over his body and wanting to move and get up. And he was laying in a, in a doorway and he began to get alarmed because he, he couldn't will his body to, to do anything. And he stayed in the scene for a while. Uh, medics came, uh, s- someone who lived in that house answered the door and looked down on him. So he, he observed the scene for a while. And then he began to kind of panic and he found himself quickly traveling mentally, telepathically to p- familiar places. Like he, he came to where his mom and I were sleeping and just observed us for a minute. He, he went to a dear friend and observed him. And, and actually the friend became aware of his presence and was very alarmed by it. Oh, it wow. felt kind of an overwhelming thing that he woke up in the middle of the night to this presence. Uh, he visited his girlfriend and, and you know, saw her sleep. And he be, it began to dawn on him that he was never going to be in these environments again. He was not, and that these relationships, as physical earthbound relationships, were over. And it was incredibly disturbing to him. And he began to feel, after a while, kind of a tug to kind of let go or to leave the scene. And he kind of went with that. Now, a lot of souls actually will stay, stay around the scene of their death and they, because there are dramas and issues that they're, they're, they're still very captured and caught up in. Those are the folks we call ghosts, you know, so that right. there are people that have some difficulty letting go of the dynamics of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, 
or may not even yet fully understand that they're dead. It took Jordan a little bit to understand that he he was not in his body anymore. I know you were going to go somewhere with that, but I'm going to back you up. So even when he was confused and realizing he was above his body, when he just thought about you, he ended up near you, right? His transportation to you was just through thought? Yeah, he could go anywhere he knew. Mm-hmm. If you already knew where it was, he could go there. He knew okay. he knew his house of his girlfriend. He knew our house. He knew his friend Mauchi and, and where he So he could bring himself to a place that he was already familiar with. But he would not necessarily have been able to go, you know, let, let me just see the Great Wall of China or something. Right, I mean, he, right. No, he was, well, it was all by yeah. his, what was pulling his heart. And I'm curious to know if you have any more information about his friend's experience and what happened in that moment that his friend sensed his presence and got scared. Do you know what it was? His friend woke up, Jordan died a little after one o'clock in the morning. And apparently within a few minutes, journey to connect to, to Mauchi. And Mauchi woke up in a state of alarm. He experienced that there was an entity, a spirit that was in the upper right-hand corner of his room looking down on him. But his alarm made him sort of assume that there was something malevolent about it. And he just wasn't able to receive He was so alarmed that he wasn't able to really receive Jordan's message. Jordan was desperately trying to uh, convey things to him and he couldn't. So uh, he kind of misinterpreted, but he had a very, very clear awareness of Jordan's presence, but he just didn't know what it was. Right. And I'm sure Jordan's energy because of the situation, just being in a brutal fight, the energy must have felt a little disturbed. You know, that's and it actually never occurred to me because he was going to, he, I mean, he was still having a lot of residual energy from a, right. a terrifying experience. And that energy may have been present and that Mauchi was picking that up. That's very interesting. Well, it's a perception that I have of spirits who we interpret as being evil or bad are just misdirected energy with their own situation. They don't mean to inflict negative things on us. It just kind of happens. And that sort of leads to what does happen next and what Jordan, does, if I can say, to describe next. Um, yes, please. He, he didn't really go through a tunnel. He just sort of went through a graying out of, of experience so that he, you know, he just couldn't couldn't see much of anything. It's like he's in a cloud. Right. And eventually he, he sees light and he's, he's moving toward light. And he arrives at this place, this is sort of this radiant garden that's uh, very um, be- beautiful, but the colors are kind of super real and it's intense light all the way around. And this is the, the landing place. And, you know, this is where we mostly all go because, it, and it's just adjacent to the spirit world. It's not actually in the spirit world. Okay. And of course, the problem we face when we're in the landing place is that we've lost our senses. We've lost our nervous system. Uh, everything that's been familiar to us and that we're attached to is gone. And we, yeah, you know, the other thing is we see in all directions. We see 360. Wow. And we move by intention, not, you know, the mere intention we move, but not, not because we're moving our legs right. and communication is all telepathic. I mean, everything is different. So yeah. there's all this adjusting that we have to do in the landing place. Right. But the, perhaps the most important adjustment though, is uh, that we have to learn to manage our minds because whatever we think, whatever, whatever images occur in our mind, we, we can actually project them. And Jordan described that, that he, he thought of home, he could, he could see his house. He, but then he, he had some, some fear and it was like, he started projecting scary images and he, he tried to calm himself down by thinking of Yosemite, which he loves. And then he, was, then he saw, saw an elephant in Yosemite and they saw a monster in Yosemite. And it was, it, it was like, uh-huh. whatever was in his mind, right. he could create energetically right. that experience and, right. and hallucinate essentially that. And so that's one of the things that is can be really problematic for us yeah. in the landing places. Like, and if we have fear, if we have a lot of anger and a lot of you know residual intense emotions from our just completed life, and we bring those into the landing place, well, that's that often is influencing us, and it sort of mm-hmm. makes us deaf to what's there. Okay. Jordan talks about you know all communication in the spirit world comes through the medium of love, just like mm-hmm. you, as we're talking. We're communicating by making air molecules vibrate. Um, 
In the spirit world, love is the medium through which all communication occurs and all the telepathic communication is contained, it's encompassed in love. Okay, so so if we get there and we're, we're full of anger or sadness or fear, despair, whatever it is, it's pretty hard to hear love. It's really hard. And right. meanwhile, the, the guides and maybe loved ones who come to greet us are trying to talk to us and convey yeah. something and we can't hear. So the, so the landing place is a place where we have to kind of get adjusted and get to the point where we can actually hear and experience the love that's around us and the guidance that's being given to us. And some of the souls, they're just not ready to get into the spirit world. Right. And they go to healing places and, and other bardos that help them complete narratives and struggles that they had in their just finished life. So there are bardos adjacent to the spirit world where there's there's healing for souls that are, still have a lot of residual pain. And so the, all of that you know exists just outside the portal of the mm-hmm. spirit world. Is that the area you think where a lot of people who have near-death experiences and come back that they get to the landing place but don't really go much farther? Yeah, the, yes. And the answer is, is mm-hmm. yes. But interestingly enough, quite a few folks who have NDEs do appear to get past the landing place because they start the life review and the life. Oh, right. The life review. The life review actually does occur inside the spirit world. I mean, you, okay. you, you left the landing place and you've actually gotten into spirit world proper to do the life review. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, so they, they may have made it through the portal, but they just are, um, you know, there's still enough life in their body that they were called back. Yeah, or an, and or purpose. And it's interesting when you talk about love being the source of communication, it's like love is in the spirit world, what breath is in our physical world. Exactly. And it is the basis of all telepathic communication. So if you're not tuned to love, you, you really are deaf. Jordan says this DOA, death on arrival. Right. <laughs> and I think you refer also to if somebody has in their mind, like I don't believe in hell at this point, but if they have in their mind that that's what they expect to see, then that may be what they see. Oh, yeah. Well, because they'll hallucinate it. If they think there's going to be flames and, <laughs> and, you know, somebody with a pitchfork, they will often hallucinate. Well, it's for the same reason that souls who expect to see Jesus or expect to see Muhammad or whoever often will conjure those images and that can be very healing. I mean, it's that particular kind of hallucination can help ease the right. transition, yeah. but others that are sort of fear-based yeah. are going to make it harder. And so the Bardos is where they sort of get a spiritual therapy, right? To kind of help them adjust. And you mentioned we have a amnesia when we're here. Yeah to our spirit life. And so that's where that is starting to come back. Yeah. We arrive in the landing place, still pretty amnesiac for, you know, who we were, our past lives, you know, what the afterlife looks like, probably not yet remembering our soul group. So, and so it it takes a while for some of these to come back. And, and usually it's starting to come back partly while you're doing your life review. Uh, But this is sort of gradually remits the amnesia. It's not like you throw a light switch and all of a sudden, you know everything. You remember everything, and oh, now now you know who you were and who all your life, past lives. And it, it takes a little while, and that, and during that time, we're kind of vulnerable. You know, the other thing I guess I I wanted to say is that souls that you know lived uh, lives that where they did significant damage to others and caused a lot of harm, and also you know carry a lot of anger or and and, mm-hmm. and scenarios of revenge and so forth. They really do need to spend some time in the Bardos working through those issues. And you could sort of think of it like purgatory. It's not, it isn't <laughs> purgatory. It's not a, it's not a place of punishment. It's a place of learning and healing uh, the damaged energy that they have and uh, soul energy that they had from their last life. Right. But <clears throat> it is something that is, is an ongoing process to get them ready to, right. to move into Cause the spirit, you can't get into the spirit world if you're full of anger, full of right. Right. Full of, uh, yes. despair full of fear it just yeah and yeah it, it, you, you can't you can't be in there uh and so the, so we need some some help in processing right. and healing sometimes before going right and with that the spirits how what do they do on the other side like basically what's the day in the life of a spirit like what do they do <laughs> each day kind of okay well that's really uh, interesting because i mean mostly they do a lot of learning and there's different kinds of learning that they do i could talk about that 
and they have a lot of fun. It's sort of like being in college. You know, you spend, <laughs> I mean, literally, Jordan's used this analogy. You spend a lot of time in classwork and you do a lot of partying. Oh, fun. And maybe some creating. And so there's a lot of, a lot of joy and fun, mm -hmm. but there's serious business in the spirit world. I mean, we're in this, we're doing in some ways the same thing in the spirit world we're doing during incarnations. We're learning. Mm -hmm. You know, souls are just little learning machines. We, we go out into the physical world and learn very specific and important lessons that you can only learn in a physical world, particularly a world in which there's pain and the pain is teaching us important things. We're learning how to love in the face of pain. Oh, we can only do that in a physical world. But in spirit, we're learning other things. Well, there are many, many things that we're learning in spirit that are crucial and important for our growth and development as souls. So, you know, there's lots of going on here. I mean, what, one of the things that spirits can do is they spend a, a lot of time, you know, studying the Akashic record of the history of not just humans on Earth, but they can also study the Akashic record of souls who incarnate on other planets and other species. And one of the things they're learning is, is the laws of change. How do things change? How, does, how do individual souls change? And how do collections of souls change and, and cultures change? What makes that happen? They learn a lot, the, a lot about the laws of mass evolution, of co evolution of consciousness. How does that happen? Because they can view history from the beginning to the end. They can, they can see the, the, the first days on earth and they can see the last days on earth. They can watch all of history and they can learn from it. But what's really cool is, is that they can learn from alternate time timelines. In other words, let's say you, um, you wanted to find out what would have happened if you'd done X differently. You know, what would it, how would that have played out? What kind of consequences? Would, you know, a dad who's kind of mean to his son and slapped his son around and was very, you know, yeah. judgmental and hurtful. Well, what if he hadn't done that? And then you can actually, we can, you can open the Akashic record and actually see how that would have played out wow. in terms of his son's experience. Seeing all of what that would have looked like, it's, so, it's an alternate reality. Yeah. And of course, as soon as you close it, like you close a book, it's just a potential story. It's not, it's not real, but we can actually, so we can learn by you looking at what if I had done X or Y? What if some figure in history had done X or Y? And we can actually learn and see what happens with these alternate realities. So it's a huge source of learning to souls that's only available in the spirit world where, the, where we can look at the Akashic record. Wow, that's so interesting. Wow. And I know you mentioned in your book about rituals. I know I deal, do a lot of rituals with my parents after they pass. Can you talk a little bit more about those rituals in the afterlife? Well, the afterlife is very structured. It is very much managed by guides. We have lots of free time too, just like when you're in college, but there's a lot of class time and there's a lot of very, very structured activities. And there are, there are several kinds of, of things that happen in the afterlife that are profound and they, and they do you know, kind of fit into the framework of rituals. And it has to do with merging. Souls can Converge with each other in groups of two or three or four, and it literally occupy the same energetic space. And in doing so, have this profound knowledge and awareness of each other, this profound love and connection. It's kind of like sex in the afterlife. And it's a very beautiful experience that souls enjoy. And many souls in, in a soul group will do this periodically, do this intense merging that, in, again, involves a deep sense of love, but also a deep sense of knowledge of seeing and knowing this other soul in a profound way. It's a swirling of like their energy and their light, right? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And another kind of merging goes on of individual souls with all or all that is or collective consciousness or God, whatever we want to call it. Uh, but they can merge briefly. It's an enormous experience. I mean, it's like uh, an overwhelming inpouring of knowledge for a soul and it can be actually kind of disruptive and it, and Jordan describes it like it's a very beautiful experience it's a very intense experience and it, and souls learn a lot by merging with all but it's like a high voltage of electricity going through a little narrow wire and souls can only take it for so long and it, it's too hot wow 
And so this merging is a beautiful experience, but it's something that has to be done in limited times. As souls get more experience, they can actually merge using a focused inquiry. So they, they can actually examine, it's almost like going to a library. Like I wanna go to the X section of the library. So the souls can merge with all and actually sort of direct their attention to learning certain things. Uh, but more less experienced souls just get blasted with uh, overwhelming sense of knowledge, just this infusion. So it's very interesting. So, the, so there there are kind of ritual merging processes that occur that have very pleasurable, but also very profoundly important in terms of soul's growth and learning. I want to say something. I wasn't planning on sharing any of my own life experience until you said this, because I know you've talked about the merging before, and I think I was hearing you in your books and other interviews, I was hearing the dividing of our soul. But for the first time, I'm realizing what you're saying is lining up with something I said when I was five to my mom. And I said, I was homesick. I wanted to go home. I didn't have another home. I didn't have other parents. And she said, what do you mean? What are you, what are you talking about? And I said, where I came from, we could get this close. And I used my hands to do crisscross. I was five. <laughs> and I said, in this world, we can only get this close. And I put my hands together side by side where the fingers don't crisscross. And I didn't know what I was saying. And I retained that memory and that conversation with her, but I don't have the memory of why I said that. And so what you're saying to us now is kind of giving me chills. <laughs> <laughs> Because I had heard about, like I was saying, that souls can, you know, have their light spin and their energy spin, but you've just explained it in a way I've never thought of before, which is pretty awesome. And what you described and what you told your mother seems so profound to me because that's exactly right. There's a, a profound aloneness we have on this planet mm -hmm. because our bodies prevent us yes. from merging, from getting yeah. getting close enough. And, and we can't see each other very well. We're, we're <laughs> opaque, kind of opaque yes. to each other. And it's hard. It's hard to have that opacity, opacity and, and have this tremendous need for merging and, and a, some vague memory somewhere uh, in, in, our, in our soul awareness that this is possible. And that this, this separation I'm suffering here, there is another way and another life. And it is a really important thing that you knew and that you conveyed to her. It just validates for me, you know, out of the mouths of babes, sometimes yeah. they say, you know, we're still so close to the veil and spirit world when we're young and then we are amnesia sets in and we forget. It's very validating to me. It's interesting. You talk about their rituals and what they're doing and planning and learning are they also aware of our current situations on earth? Like, does Jordan know about the pandemic and our social injustice? I mean, what do they think? Are they all looking at us and just rolling their eyes and going, oh my gosh, they're crazy? Or what have you heard about that? No, actually, Jordan spends a lot of time paying attention to what's going on with the people he loves. He's, he's talks about watching over them, guiding them you know, whispering to them, helping them in various ways. I feel like he's helping me all the time. You know, I, I'm, I feel him, I hear him inside saying, oh, don't, don't, do, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, or just conveying to me, you know, a sense that this is the way to go. This is the right choice. Right. And of course, I can, I can channel with him and I can get very direct communication, but I'm also, he's sending me impressions a lot. So he okay. is very present. And I think, I think most souls uh, who are close, you know, close to people who are still incarnate uh, are pretty involved. Now, I don't think that's everybody, but I think most souls are pretty involved. And particularly if the, if the soul that's incarnate is inviting that, because souls in spirit are just a thought away. Ralph Metzner taught me this, and it is profoundly true. They're just a thought away. As soon as you think of that soul, you open the channel and they are present. They are they are ready. Their attention is brought to you. And then you can very deliberately do things once you've opened the channel. And what most people don't know is once that channel is open, you can ask questions, you can have, you can start communicating directly. But the mere thought of that other soul that's in spirit is enough to open the channel. And then we can deliberately exploit that for, you know, deep communication if we choose. Awesome. And you mentioned past lives. Can we talk more about that? And what does Jordan say about reincarnation, the future lives and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Well, first of all, he says there's no heaven and hell. 
uh, and there's no judgment and there's no pass fail in terms of <laughs> right. your life that we're just learning and we yeah. incarnate to learn. That's the whole function of the lives that we live. And sometimes we choose very difficult lives because we learn more in difficult lives. So everything is, a, is about learning and one life is hardly enough <laughs> to do the learning that we need to do. And we, many of us have hundreds of lives right. um, and we become more and more wise as we have these many lives as we, and a lot of our wisdom comes from making mistakes. And so that's the, the other thing he says, there's no good or bad. That's just, it's an illusion of religion. It's not, it doesn't exist in the spirit world and it has really nothing to do with us. I mean, we can do things that have unfortunate consequences or painful consequences for ourselves right. and others. These are things we're learning from. Right. And we learn by paying attention to those consequences. Right. You know, Jordan has talked to me a lot about, you know, the men who actually assaulted and, and murdered him. And, mm. and he talks about they're in a learning process. That, that, ex, that experience has had a profound effect on their souls. And, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to worry, he says, about some sort of earthly justice. It's all handled with karma. The learning is what's happening. It's not about punishing or paying people back for doing uh, painful things. It's that we're all involved in learning and we are continuing to do that life after life after life. So yes, there's definitely past lives. He asserts that. I've done some regressions with Ralph Messner where we looked at some of the past lives that Jordan and I shared. We were in a yeshiva together uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, I was a young rabbi in making, and he was an old rabbi, and we had a very yeah. deep relationship in that yeah. place, and he was my mentor and my teacher. In another life, he was my wife. Wow. And in another life, he was an unrequited love. I'm so I, I've had a number of lives with him yeah. and that I know about, and there probably others I don't. Well, and it's fascinating. And a lot of us, you know, Trisha and I both were raised Christian. The idea of reincarnation was a hard concept to grasp, but it's always resonated more with me because I could never, even as a child, understand why an infant has one shot at life and one shot at knowing Jesus, or they are, you know, out of the picture. <laughs> that never made sense to me. So knowing that we have this growing and learning that we continue is very refreshing, and it does settle better with me than not. I think you've talked a little bit about this too in the I know there's no judgment on, it, on the other side, but when we do our life review, it, it's us who ourselves who are really assessing what had happened and feeling our effects on other people, not just seeing what we did wrong, but now in a way we wouldn't have known before, yeah. right? The life review is one of the most profound experiences a soul can have, at least that's what Jordan suggests. And it happens pretty soon after we get into the spirit world. I mean, we're not there very long after we got out of the landing place. We get in the spirit world. And life review starts pretty soon. And, and, and some, as we said, some NDE years actually get as far as life review. Mm -hmm. Life review is a kind of a reverie. And they're, they're guides that are helping us and supporting us in the process. But we go into kind of a meditation of reverie. And we review everything that we did. Every, every choice that we made in the course of a lifetime. But it's done in a very particular way. Not only do we look at that ch choice from our own vantage point of you know, what we did, but we experience it as the other person experienced it. So let's go back to that example, his father slaps his son. Mm -hmm. He experiences it as his son experienced that slap. But, but this is the thing that's sort of amazing. Not only does he experience it as the, as the son experienced the slap, but he experiences it as the son over time experienced the effects of that slap, wow. the effects on his self-esteem, the effects on his ability to trust, the, the wow. effects on his, and how he, how he you know, began to conceptualize the world and relationships and all of that. So that is part of watching each act and each choice wow. and seeing its effect immediately and its effect over time on, on that other soul or souls uh, who we impacted. So it's an incredible experience and it's very hard. It's very arduous. Even people who've led relatively generous and, and caring and loving lives uh, have a lot of moments where they affected others in, in painful ways. And all of that has to be reviewed and, and learned and, and digested. Right, and it sounds scary 
But as you said, once you're there, it's the judgment is more of our earthly physical trait and judgment is yeah. not the same it's there. Judgment. It's right. just experiencing. It's mm-hmm. just seeing. It's just knowing. And it's not like, oh, I'm bad. Uh, right. It's like, oh, I see when I did X, this right. is what happened. When I slapped my son, this is what happened. Oh, my uh-huh. God. Right. So it's different from judgment and guilt. It's perception and growth is what's happening even though it, it's painful to, to, to see and review some of these things. And so I know we won't go into it because we would run out of time, but we choose our future lives as well because of the lessons we want to live. Has Jordan said anything about, can he see future lives or has he said anything about future lives? Well, that's really interesting because we actually could can choose lives at any point in the timeline. Uh, so for example, we could, you know, the next, my next life, I could conceivably choose something that's happening 500 years from now, uh, wow. an environment, a place. But souls don't typically do that because it's t- so disruptive. I mean, they, 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 you know, a soul that might have, you know, lived in the 20s or 30s, you know, might usually choose to come back in, a, in an adjacent timeline right. because, you know, there's still cars, there's still trains, there's still <laughs> a lot of familiar yeah. things. So yeah. it's, right. it's like it's like the souls are drawn to, to familiar things and, and environments that they know okay. um, and um, or, or, or environments that they love. Right. Um, so uh, we, we tend to choose lives that are sequential, not always though. And, um, and we could, we can, but we can choose a life that's well into, way into the future, but generally speaking, we can't observe those lives because this is a really a paradox of time in the in the spirit world. Time is different there. Here, of course, time is events. It's 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 changed. Time is measured by change. The hands right. on the clock are changing. This the it's a time of day is like changing. The sun is changing. Whatever. Right. It's all measured by change. In the spirit world, it's measured by change. But the change is that the difference between the moment I didn't know something to the moment I do know something. Okay. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the spirit world time is it's different. It is the moment of learning. The, the before that and the after that. Right. And so there are certain things we can't know before we know them. And, and so there are limitations on, on, on what we can look at in the future. Um, but it's really, it's really interesting about time and the spirit world and how, how profoundly different it is than what we see and know in the, in the earth time. Wow. And um, how do you communicate with him if he's currently um, incarnated and like the dividing of energy? Can we yeah. talk about that? that? Yeah, that's so important. There's a whole concept of Atman and Jiva, uh, uh, certain schools of, of, of thinking. And, you know, Atman is the part of our energy that always stays in the spirit world. And Jiva is the part that will leave the spirit world to incarnate and, and enter a physical life, a physical body. Um, so some of our energy always remains in the spirit world. And that's how Jordan can continue to communicate with me because he's already incarnated again. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's incarnated as a female in a very different culture. Oh, wow. uh, and, and so, but only part of his energy lives in that world and in that body. Part of his energy always remains in the spirit world in, in, in a, an adjacent soul group. And and part of my energy and part of your energy always remains in the spirit world. And, and just by the way, when you do channeling, you can channel to your own. Your self, higher self. Your higher wow. self. Uh, mm-hmm. You can have communication with your higher self and, 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 and just simply be clear about what the address is, your, your spiritual address that you're, you're right. trying to reach out to. It, it could, it, you know, it can be someone who you love and this other side, but it can be to your own higher self with all the knowledge you've collected over many lifetimes. So you, your higher self, of course, has wisdom that we can't have in just one lifetime here. So uh, that's another thing you can do. So some of our soul is always in spirit. Some of it uh, turns, some of that energy can be divided and incarnated. So yeah, and, and that's why he can communicate to me. And that's why you can have a loved one who may already have incarnated uh, and and so still fair. be in communication. And, and that's the other thing that Jordan says. And I think maybe this is maybe the most important thing is that um, we are always together, the living and the dead. Um, all of the souls we love 
uh, some of them we're not even aware of in, in, in any in individual incarnation, but all of the souls that we love are connected to us and remain always connected to us. We, ne we can't lose them. Uh, uh, we're, and, and, the, and we're always part of the whole. We're, we're part of all that is. So every, every soul we love, that connection remains absolute, un, uh, inviolate. It's always there. Um, and so this illusion of aloneness is just that. It's an illusion. Right. Those relationships are always there and we can access them through channeling and, and other means that give us uh, certain kind of meditations that give us that connection to the whole and so forth. Right. And I want to ask you about the channeling, but I was also going to add, because the hardest concept I've had to wrap my head around has been that soul being in different places at different times. It's almost like if our soul can collectively is the ocean and you go with a bucket and you lift a little bit of water out of the ocean, you can also pour that water back in. And that's kind of how our soul can come to the earth and go back and still be part of a collective whole. So I've heard it with like cookie dough as well. You can pull some cookie dough out and make one cookie or put it back in the whole cookie dough. So that kind of helped me think of souls differently. Yeah, Jordan actually doesn't, doesn't use those metaphors. He says souls remain individual entities. Okay. They don't return to just morphing back into the whole. Some Buddhist concepts, you know, suggest that. Right. The bit of water that comes out of the ocean is just poured back in. But he, Jordan claims absolutely that we retain individual identities. Okay. I like that. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and Michael Newton confirms that. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. And, you know, Ian Stevenson and his, his study of children who have remember past lives their identity remains intact across okay. multiple lives. And the reason for this, Jordan says, is because we're engaged in learning. And if we lose our identity, in, in, in essence, we sort of lose what we've, what we've learned so far. Right. Wow. And so our identity can, continues across multiple lifetimes. And all that we learn, we gather and hold from all of those lifetimes. And of course, we contribute what we learn to all. Right. Everything we learn as an individual soul is uploaded to all. Mm -hmm. But we are still engaged in this process of individually connecting to and engaging with a physical world and a spirit world as individual souls. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. So can you elaborate a little? You, you mentioned that and you have a chapter in your book. So anybody listening, please get his book to read more yes. about it. But how we can channel ourselves. The first thing you want to do if you're in a channel is get something that connects you to the loved one on the other side, something that they gave you, something that they had. It could be anything. I, I just used a little business card that Jordan had. You want something for eye fixation. Candles work very nicely and, and try to get something that looks nice, that, that feels aesthetically pretty to you, uh, you know, in the candle base and so forth. So eye fixation is, is helpful to kind of get into that calmness. And then you need to have something to write on. I think it's very important, particularly in the beginning when you're channeling, to, to write out your questions and to write out the answers you get. Then a simple breath-based meditation. Usually what I'll do is I'll, I'm counting my out-breaths. I'm paying attention to the physical experience of the breath and noticing this, the breath in the center of my body down in my diaphragm. I'm focusing my attention on my diaphragm and counting the each out breath. And when I have a thought, I notice the thought could bring my attention back to the breath. Just a very, very simple mm -hmm. breath focused meditation. And I'll do that for a round of 10, maybe another round of 10, maybe another round of 10, mm -hmm. depending on you know how long it takes me to begin to feel a quietness. When I begin to feel a quietness, I just, I bring my attention to the top of my head. And I actually feel very, I feel very significant sensations when I'm channeling in the top of my head and also somewhat down my spine. So bring your attention here and then just imagine an orb, the color of the sun, uh, the color of the sun, just a little bit above your head. Just, just imagine that there, just above your, your hairline, your scalp, and then allow that orb to extend and lengthen upward. And that is the opening of the channel to the other side. And you're sending this channel to a specific virtual address to, some, to someone, your higher self or someone you love on the other side, whoever it is. Now that the channel is open, it's important now to just 
start by writing your first question, you know, and, and watching in itself is a meditation, just watching the words form on a page, just let them form. And then what you do is you listen. And, and the very first thing that shows up, the very first word that shows up in your mind, write that down. It doesn't matter what it is. And then wait, and you'll notice that another word will show up and then another. And sometimes, you know, a, a phrase or a sentence. In the beginning, it's kind of halting. Uh, after a while, it, the channel opens up much more easily and the communications are much more um, free, uh, free flowing. But in the beginning, it's just a matter of just hearing that first word, waiting for the next word, waiting for the next word or phrase at the end of the sentence, is there more? Give it some time, see if there's another, there's more. And then if, if there's nothing more, just ask the next question. And don't worry about, you're not expecting to hear, you know, a, a thunderclap or a, a voice from heaven or anything like that. It's, it's, you're going to hear it in your own mind, mm -hmm. but you're also hearing it. And this is one of the things I've noticed that it's, it's, it's Jordan's kind of language, not mine, mm -hmm. his way of, of communicating, not mine. And he often says things that I would never have thought or imagined. Right. And so I know this is coming from another entity outside of my own consciousness. And I just encourage you when you're listening to that other soul to be aware that they're communicating in their own way, in their own style, and that you're privileged to be able to listen to them and converse with them, that you you have your side of the conversation too. There's questions you want to ask, or maybe things you want to tell this other soul, right. things that are important for you to, to convey to them. And all of that can be part of the channel uh, conversation. That's wow. beautiful. And then always thank the soul for and then thank them. Yeah, that's that's, that's beautiful. And I'm sure that's yeah. gonna be valuable for everyone listening. Yeah, I'm gonna be trying that soon to talk to my parents. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about the hypnotherapy that you do? I'm actually going to get that done. Do you have any tips? How can Trisha prepare herself? <laughs> you don't have to prepare yourself. If, if, if it's a competent life between life hypnotherapist, uh, they'll lead you through the process. But I mean, it, the process usually involves an induction that uh, some period of time you have to get fairly deep. And, uh, you know, there's various ways of doing the induction. I won't bore you with all that. But at some point, you're going down a stairway of time and you end up, according to Newton's process, into the womb, your mother's womb. And you, you spend some time there. And then from your mother's womb, you can enter a tunnel that takes you back to a significant moment in, the, in a fairly immediate past life. And as soon as you get there, you look down and see what your feet look like and start looking around in your environment and what, what do you look like and so forth. Uh, where are you? Who, who's there? And ultimately, after certain exploration of that life or that environment, the person has progressed to their death in that life. Okay. And then as they die, they are, you know, they, the, the, the induction follows them up to, you know, whatever the next steps and stages of, of their afterlife experience. And they begin to move through the different elements of the afterlife. So it is a profound experience and it's really changing. And one of the most important things about the experience is there's, there's a, after the life review, there's usually a, a part of it that involves, it's called a council of elders or what have you. It's, it's sort of not just reviewing that life, but, you know, talking about, well, what was the, what was the purpose of that life? What, what, what were you here to learn in that life? that you've just completed. And also some of the things that you hadn't yet learned or you're, you're still in the mm -hmm. process. And then another part of it usually involves going to the life circle or it's called different things where you choose another life. And the, in that case, you're choosing this life, the life, the yeah, life. You're you're in now. Yeah. Right. How did you make that choice? And, and what was it about this life that was important for you and part of your lesson plan that what's the meaning of this life for you in terms of what you're doing and in terms of what you're, how you're growing and evolving as a soul. So there's, a, there's elements in this life that are very important uh, that are teaching you something and you can actually get in touch with some of that uh, part of the regression. Oh, wow. Would it serve her to maybe have an intention for herself as well that she sort of sets with herself? You can set an intention that you're going to okay. learn a lot about what your purpose was in this life. You know, what did you come to this life to learn? Okay. This, this current incarnation. I think that can be a very important part of the life review because it, it sort of sets you on a course of like, oh, I see 
this is how I need to be moving in this life. These are the things that I'm learning. These are the values that I need to be enacting. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. The final words, the takeaway for our listeners yes. who are hurting from loss of a child or a loved one and what Jordan has felt all souls need to know. Yeah. What's important to you to know is what was important for me to know. You have not lost that loved one. That loved one is still with you. That loved one you can have access to anytime you think of them and open the channel. That love cannot be lost. Love is eternal. Once love, the flame of love lights between two souls, it will always be there. On earth, of course, we get mad at people and we, we, <laughs> we, our relationships come and go. Yeah. But in terms of the, the, the eternal life of souls, once that love exists, it will always exist. And the souls on the other side will always love us, will always be interested in us, will always care about us, and for the most part, will be ready to communicate with us if we want to do that and if we don't want to open the shot. So you're not alone. You have not lost your loved one. We are all together always. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So email us at trisha.misty.tm at gmail.com. Our podcast, Surviving Death and Dying, is available worldwide on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeart, Amazon Audible, Listen Note, Facebook, YouTube, and more. You can also go to our website, survivingdeathanddying.com, where we have links to the books we talk about. So please like, share, subscribe, and follow. We did it again. We survived death and dying. Another episode. Because we believe life and love never dies.